Hello everyone, um, again welcome to this uh, Sierra Academy's uh, course on uh, Linux and programming languages. Uh, today we are going to begin our lecture with uh, Linux, Linux basics. Um, my name is Anand and I will be their instructor for this course. Um, I will be today like I am mean, going to mainly talk about the Linux basics. Um, some of the history of Linux, uh, how it evolved into where it is today and why um, commercially it is very successful and we will see why it is very successful commercially and then we will also start uh, working on the Linux uh, with um, how it is structured, uh, mainly we will study about the, the file structures, um, file systems and um, the various uh, programs that are embedded in Linux. And then uh, I will be taking you through how to interact with Linux. Um, we will begin with uh, some of the commands, the basic commands uh, that uh, we will review. And then um, I think um, we will cover as much uh, as many comments as possible today and then we will leave it for the next lecture. So let us begin. So let us uh, briefly talk about uh, the history of Linux. The history of Linux uh, is not complete without uh, talking about the history of Unix itself. I think uh, many of you are familiar with Unix um, having worked on it in, in different um, times at different times um, so far. Uh, Unix is an operating system very similar to Windows or um, any other operating system that you may be familiar with. One other thing that comes to mind today is, uh, it is widely used is the iOS, which is the operating system that is in the Apple um, iPhones. Um, Windows is very popular. That's the uh, operating system supported by Microsoft. It's widely used in almost all the PCs today. Probably it has a market share of uh, about eighty percent or so. Uh, Unix is mainly used in the scientific computation world, uh, which includes the LSI design and many other areas. Uh, we will see why it is widely used in those uh, computing worlds. Uh, the Unix itself was developed more than 40 years ago, in 1969, at the AT&T Bell Labs. Uh, the two pioneers, Ken Thompson and Dennis Ritchie, were the uh, main people developing this um, operating system. Um, and in fact, if you look at the timeline, actually it predates even the Windows operating system, which was probably in the into being in 70s. Um, one thing to note about Unix is it is a command line interpreter. What that means is, um, as you type the commands, that's how it understands what you are typing and what you're requesting, and then it services what you are requesting. Uh, it is developed for mini computers um, as you know the computing world itself evolved um, right in the from 1930s when the big mainframes were invented by IBM. Um, then um, the IBM uh, the, then the mainframes actually shrunk into mini computers and then in the 1970s the PC revolution started with uh, the PCs becoming um, coming into the focus. Um, for the uh, mainframes themselves, uh, the operating systems were proprietary and people used to interact with the computers using punch cards and various uh, other types of programming, not really um, developing any uh, kind of uh, personal uh, programming um, interfaces. So, it, it will be like more like a batch program, so everybody will be writing a program, they will be submitting into a punch card machine which turns the program into punch cards and then one person collects all these punch cards, goes to the computer, he runs those punch cards and then the computer will produce some results again in the form of a punch card or um, some kind of a printout and then that printout is distributed to everyone who wrote the program and they can look at the results and then they go, go and modify the program. The mini computers really started the revolution where the computers started interacting with people on a one on one basis. Um, 
so this is again one of the key aspects um, and this also prompted what is the time sharing which means that um, every person gets a fixed time on the computer I hope uh, in your um, experience too you must have taken these kind of um, computing courses where you actually sit in the terminal do a fixed time of, time of uh, work and then move on and then somebody else will take your spot and kind of a time sharing um, you can also think of time sharing in a much more granular form that we will talk about in the later stages of the course um, and um, again as I mentioned um, the Unix is the predecessor for Linux and um, we will see like how Linux came into being and uh, um, what are the key aspects of Linux and why is it popular today. So Linux itself, Linux was created by Linus Torvalds uh, in 1991. It is created as an open source. When uh, Linus actually proposed uh, Linux, he said that this is a lightweight operating system, and this needs to be an open system. Um, and it is a variant of Unix in the sense that it uses predominantly the, the core basics of Unix, and um, then it, it it adds some more. So one of the key aspects of uh, uh, Linux is this open source and we will see like what is an open source and why is it important. So before we look at that let us look at uh, what exactly is Linux. So Linux is a fully networked 32 bit as well as a 64 bit Unix like operating system. Uh, what this means is it uses Unix tools like said arc and grep we will again talk about these things later on in the course um, just to remember these uh, um, terms said arc and grep um, we will see what, what they are um, it has built in compilers for various programming languages C, C++, Fortran, Smalltalk and Ada these are the two other languages um, that are also supported. Um, these are expert system like uh, languages um, we will we will not be learning about these languages but just remember that it has a support for multiple uh, languages as well and then it also supports networking tools like telnet, FTP, ping, trace route etc. I hope um, you guys are already familiar with some of these uh, terms. Uh, for example, Telnet is uh, Telnet allows users to communicate to computers which are remote, remotely located. So they can actually use Telnet as a protocol to log in into a computer which is situated maybe like across the globe, and then basically um, use it as a server to service whatever their programming needs. FTP is um, it is an acronym for um, file transfer protocol again this is mainly used for transferring one file to another one file from one location to another location um, again we will we will talk about some more concepts on the FTP as to how we can use it and things like that thing is a um, just a remote uh, system where you can actually um, see whether a particular machine is alive or dead. Um, using the spin program and uh, we will talk about all those things uh, in a much uh, later uh, stage again as I mentioned uh, Linux uh, provides a way for multiple users to communicate or multiple users to use so it is a multi user multitasking and multi processor system uh, why is this important multi user because now it is not like your PC where um, you are actually sitting and you, you have your own um, system your own window you just communicate to it and then basically like it, it serves you and so for example if you are editing a, um, a, a word document that word document is so personal that only you can do it you, unless you put it on the web or you use a mail program to send it to somebody nobody else is uh, uh, will be able to see what you are trying to do whereas in a multi user situation actually you can do some things and then your friend can come and 
um, add on top of it things like that so again the multi user is key aspect why it is preferred in this uh, computing world in the scientific computing world multitasking again um, you can simultaneously work on many tasks within the Linux uh, operating system this is another key aspect today um, in personal computing world like I mean if you contrast it against the Windows operating system Windows also allows you to actually have multiple programs open but you still can only work on one program at a time here you can actually see multiple programs as one program runs you can actually work on another one things like that it uh, it forms with multiple windows in the inside the same operating system and multi processor again that is the uh, uh, important because now you can actually add on processors to increase the throughput of a given program and um, work simultaneously with these multiple processors uh, again contrasting to a Windows operating system Windows provides uh, maybe multiple CPUs in the machine but it still is working on only one of the aspects of it whether it is multi CPU multi core it is it's still it is servicing only one user one program it has uh, an X Windows GUI um, again X Windows is uh, different from your normal Microsoft Windows um, in the sense that now you can um, open up multiple um, terminals inside the same window and then work in each of these terminals differently. It also coexists with other operating system. One of the key things that you will notice um, that uh, today's x86 um, world actually now um, you can put two operating systems at the same time. For example, in your um, PCs, you can create a partition where you can uh, have a Linux operating system on one side, one partition, and then the Windows operating system on the other other side. Um, it also runs on multiple platforms uh, again this is another key thing as I mentioned now the Linux works on x86 it also works on spark processors uh, HPs that you can name it like I mean all these platforms uh, can support Linux and uh, the important aspect that I mentioned uh, in the previous slide was that uh, Linux is an open source and yes so it includes the source code as part of the operating system so even though um, we call it uh, an open source um, you have to think of this as um, um, providing this uh, source code for majority of the programs and we will see like I mean how this has evolved into even better and uh, why people use it. So let's see, like, why Linux is free. Um, I mean, Linux is used today by a lot of companies. Number one is Linux is free, so you can view and edit the source code very easily. Um, the source code comes uh, shipped as part of the, the the executable itself, as a part of the OS. Even though I call it like Linux is free, in reality, it's really not free. Um, there are commercial systems like the Red Hat, Fedora, who actually um, produce Linux for commercial consumption. Um, the the thing is, even though Linus Torvalds' original vision was to have this Linux as a free operating system, uh, it it served a lot of purposes. But at the same time, you know, support became an issue, and uh, some of these companies took over the support. And so that they can provide the bug fixes and uh, additional updates to certain features that the users are requesting uh, in a more streamlined fashion. So that's the reason why there are commercially available Linux installations. And of course, the commercial um, installations are attractive for the companies like um, um, ones who work on the design. Or VLSI design, for example, uh, because they at least uh, get a reliable installation of Linux rather than um, looking at the open source and see like when some of the bugs may be fixed or something like that. 
and it is fully customizable so um, again people can write their own custom scripts and custom uh, tools on top of Linux um, and with for example if you have a real time operating system or, or sorry real time processor then you want to make it a real time operating system you can put your own customizations on top of the Linux operating system to make it uh, real time. Um, one of the key features uh, is the stability which is uh, which again comes from the open source um, because once it is open source it is tested and uh, verified by large uh, community of users and they actually can constantly test the, the new code as well as uh, they provide the bug fixes too. So it is basically about 30 years of testing has gone into this um, operating system and hence we get a very reliable uh, and a stable installation. Again this is critical for um, uh, critical applications um, even real estate design for example is a critical application and so um, we need these kind of uh, highly stable environment and it is also um, good for the shared environment as it offers today. Linux also has a better uh, security structure uh, we notice that actually in, in Windows we come across uh, several Trojan attacks and uh, virus attacks but for the Linux side we seldom see any of these kind of uh, attacks um, by the spurious program the reason is uh, the, the security infrastructure that is already built in as part of the Linux. Um, since all these um, the way that it works is uh, very reliable and very consistent it is very hard to break in into this uh, these operating systems and it is also highly portable um, we can if we have a new um, processor or a hardware platform it is very easy to actually extend into that platform and uh, it is also written actually it is written in C so that actually makes it more portable across these uh, multiple um, platforms. So now that uh, we have explained uh, why Linux is used uh, by a lot of companies today um, um, let us look at uh, what are the main features of Linux so that we can familiarize ourselves with Linux. So Linux has three most uh, important parts one is called the kernel the other is the shell and the third one is the, is the file system. So let us begin from the bottom which is the, the hardware. So again the, the goal of um, the Linux is um, to actually uh, to for the users to communicate with the with the, the hardware so on the bottom we have the hardware on the top we have the users so the users actually communicate with the hardware so let us see how they do it. So the first layer that uh, Unix uh, the Linux offers is uh, the operating system itself um, which is essentially um, has the process management memory management etc they are the very low level programs which uh, goes into the hardware resources and they try to control the hardware resources. Um, on top of these uh, programs we have the standard libraries which are used um, for opening closing read write fork etc these are the regular commands that are um, that support or that uses these process management and memory management and IO programs they call these programs to do these things 
and on top of that is the standard utility programs like shell editors, compilers, etc. And uh, they actually call these uh, other programs to facilitate how to do certain tasks. So as a user, you interact with these shell editors and the compilers. So as I mentioned earlier, the three main systems are the three main uh, parts of Linux are the kernel, shell, and the file system. So you interact with what is the what is known as the shell. And then the shell themselves have work with the kernel, which are the the the, the, the various management functions, the process management, memory management, etc. And um, and that in turn works with the hardware to satisfy uh, your requests. So let's. Um, Look at uh, some more of the terminologies themselves. So, when the users communicate with the shell editors, that aspect is known as the user interface. So, as I mentioned, the various terminals that you open within the X uh, windows are all the, the user interfaces, and that part that uh, forms um, the shell. And we will also see like what is the shell, the shell is actually driving, it is uh, the program that is driving these terminals so that um, you will be able to interact with the, um, um, with the computer. Then uh, the shell, then the shell itself uh, works uh, with the standard library and we just call it as the library interface. And then finally, the the libraries um, are populated using these for the management commands, um, process management, memory management, etc., which manages the the hardware resources, and that's what is called the system call interface. That uh, interface between the libraries and the operating system. On the other hand, we see that actually the all these programs that uh, Really work on the process management, memory management, etc. They are called the kernel, and then anything above kernel is the user mode or the shells. And uh, going in between is the file system, which we will see how the file system will be organized, um, etc. So let's look at uh, the kernel in more details. So the kernel is the heart of the operating system. It's the lower lower level core of the system. That's the interface between the application and the hardware. So you can think of um, the kernel as um, essentially their programs that calls various um, hardware resources, and they also um, make sure that uh, your Programs finally are getting executed in time um, on certain um, um, processors or on certain more the hardware resources and with all the resources intact uh, with the required resources. So the functions that uh, it performs are managing the memory, managing the I/O devices, and then one of the key things that we talked about was this. Um, Shared uh, time sharing between the the processes, so again it provides it allocates time between the user and the process. It also does the inter-process communication, which becomes very key when we talk about um, whether we want to interrupt a process, whether a process communicates with another process, handing over things, um, and it also sets process priorities. So let's look at uh, a, a brief example. Um, for example, you if you have a if you're writing a program, um, say like you're starting a big uh, array, so it it knows how to fetch that array from a memory, and then uh, you are actually interacting through the I/O devices. So it also watches the I/O devices as if there are any additional inputs that are com coming in. 
and meanwhile another user can start a program to compile a pro, uh, his uh, or he can start a program to actually go through a dictionary and sort and find a particular word so it again time shares between these two processes um, so that it knows like okay it works on this for some time like a sorting program while it goes and like searches the dictionary uh, for some other time and then meanwhile you may say that okay you know what um, I forget this program I want to kill this process and then so I press the control C we will see what are the commands in the later stage but say you press the control C and then now suddenly um, that becomes an interrupt and it understands that interrupt and basically kill that process and say like uh, if you want a process to communicate to another one essentially like I mean you have started a process now for reading the memory or writing into the memory and then you want your answers to go into that process again it basically it understands which processes need to communicate between each other and then it correspondingly does that. And when you are doing all these things suddenly like the memory management process comes along and says that you know what freeze all the programs that you are running now I want to see like I mean how, how the various sectors are there I want to compress some of the sectors and then I will free up. So that process gets a higher priority and that is also set by the kernel. So you can think of the kernel as the main thing that drives all the things and making sure that everything works properly. So now let us look at the shell uh, what does that provide the shell program is uh, it is the topmost program or topmost interface between the user and the, the kernel and um, it usually contains a command interpreter um, and it also has its own programming capability. So what this means is uh, a shell is something that you see in the terminal when it comes to a prompt uh, the prompt is represented as a dollar or a greater than sign um, then it comes to that it actually means that, that the command interpreter is active. Now whatever you type in is interpreted as a command and once you press enter that command gets executed. The command gets executed in the background the shell understands that command it takes that command it executes the command and then it spits out the results and then again it goes back to that prompt and sits and waits for your uh, command the next command. So you can think of shell as uh, your own personal slave um, is ready to do whatever it takes to satisfy the master. So you tell him one command he just goes and runs the command he gives you the output whether it is an error or a real output he produces the output and then he sits back and waits for your next command so he is really a, like a dumb waiter think of it uh, think of the shell that way and um, shells are of multiple types one particular shell is called the bond shell uh, it is denoted as this sh uh, and um, it was a shell made by Stephen Bond so he just called his own name that is the sh and then the other one is the C shell it is uh, denoted as CSH actually there is a typo here just note down that it is actually CSH um, there is a modified uh, C shell which is also called TC shell uh, and then there is something called con shell which is denoted as KSH and then uh, there is a then the another shell called born again shell which is also denoted as bash or BASH. Um, the then Linus Torvalds first uh, invented uh, Linux operating system he actually coded the bash on top of the Linux uh, so the first shell that was coded on Linux was the bash or the born again shell. So now that we looked at the second part of uh, the operating system called the shell now we move on to the next one which is the file system. So once you understand the, the kernel the shell and the file system then we can move on into the various um, um, uh, commands. So let us look at this file system 
one concept key concept of uh, Linux is that Linux treats everything whether it is a hardware resource or an IO device whatever it is it treats them as files. So for example if you are um, using a um, keyboard to enter the keyboard itself is a file so you can say like read keyboard which means that it opens a file called keyboard and it tries to read whatever you type in. So now my question is how do you actually write it into a terminal the terminal device is also a file so if you write from your program into a, a file called terminal that gets displayed into the terminal. Uh, now the hardware resources are also like various files so they get executed um, we will see in, in the later uh, uh, sections as to how they are denoted uh, usually they are denoted as slash dev or devices um, and um, one other key aspect of it is um, there is a fixed hierarchy for the file system and that is how the operating system finds where everything is residing for example if you want to put a device you will typically put it into a, a slash dev or um, if you have uh, other files you will be putting the, uh, putting it into another uh, location again the top level of uh, the, the directory or the top level directory is known as the root and that is denoted as just the slash. So when I say slash dev that means that it is a hierarchy under that slash which contains some devices and then there are several other things you will see like slash etc slash bin various things which denotes uh, specific functions and um, we will talk about that in, in a later stage. So now that we understood uh, the three main things. Um, we can start looking into um, some of the commands and how to navigate through the Linux operating system. So, in order to get started, we need a couple of things. So, when when you start a device uh, with the Linux operating system, typically you go to the computer, you turn it on. Now, what happens? You see like bunch of stuff going on your monitor, uh, scrolling through the monitor. Which, which basically initializes several devices, your file system, your disks, um, etc., and etc. Once uh, they are all initiated, uh, initialized, then the system boots up, and uh, also it boots up the X Windows, and then finally it comes up with a screen, which contains, uh, which asks you for login information. So the login information typically is uh, you need to provide the username and the password and um, the username is typically set by the system administrator it is a it's user specific it is your own personal unique name and in Linux uh, every keyword every username everything is case sensitive so an uppercase anand may be different from a lowercase anand. So two people can have different usernames with just the case differences and your password is also case sensitive and password you can change at any time even though you cannot change your username at any time you need to go through the system administrator to change the username. Uh, we will see like how we can change the password in, in the later section but password can be changed by the user at any time. So now that um, you have logged in into the system with uh, the username and password now what happens so now the system actually comes up with a, a number of windows maybe one window or several other windows they are called the terms or X terms uh, which are which stands for just X terminal on the on top of the uh, GUI and uh, inside each of the terminal it also it starts the, the shell that we talked about and this could be one of the many shells that uh, that are supported 
uh, that I talked about and when you know that the shell is active because the shell comes up with a prompt and as I mentioned the prompt can be just a dollar sign a percentage sign or even just a, um, an, a greater than symbol. Once you have the prompt now you can ask it to perform the tasks that you want uh, uh, to get out of it. So they are what are called commands. So these commands tell the operating system to perform a set of operations. So these operations uh, we will see what kind of operations can you ask the, the operating system to perform. The typical syntax of uh, the command is uh, as follows the command followed by options followed by arguments again command options and finally arguments. So how do we use these uh, this uh, commands um, let us first talk about some basic commands and then we will go more into how the more advanced commands and how we can string these commands together to perform uh, various uh, operations. So let us look at some of the basic commands. So these are all just uh, shortcuts or control keys essentially. So how do how can we use the control key to perform various functions. So um, if you look at your keyboard the control key is uh, probably at the bottom most key and on your left hand side it just says uh, CTL. So we use that for doing certain operations. So in uh, Linux uh, control S means it will pause the display. So once the display is paused actually even if you type anything nothing will show up on the terminal. The control Q on the other hand will restart the display so that uh, once you pause and you can restart using the control uh, Q. The other nifty uh, control sequences are control C uh, that cancels an operation. So you type in a long command suddenly you find that actually you know what I do not want to execute this command let me um, cancel this one you can do a control C on it or say like you started a command using a, like a, in the command interpreter and it is just going and it is running and you do not know like I mean after one hour you come back and see that actually it is still running and you want to just cancel that command because you know that it will not take more than an hour. So again you do the control C and immediately it aborts that command and then comes back to the prompt. So for cancelling an operation um, you can do the control C. Control U cancels a line again the same thing once you start typing a line and then you just wanted to about midway and then because you may have uh, done a typo then you basically do a control U and then just uh, retype that line. Control D is the to signal the end of file and control V is uh, to treat any following characters as a normal character. For example if you type control V and then control C it does not take the control C it just uh, thinks that you just typed as a C and then it just types the C. Other nifty control keys are control A to go to the um, beginning of the line. So for example you are typing a long command and suddenly you think that oh man I made a mistake in the command name and I want to change the command name. So you can go to you can just press control A and then immediately the cursor will go to the first character of that uh, command and then from there you can either retype it or you can use arrow keys to move uh, left and right. And then the other nifty one is also control E which takes you to the end of the line which is uh, also pretty useful um, when you want to come back after typing this particular uh, or making a change in the beginning of the command now you want to go back to the end of the command and then start continuing to um, type the remainder of the command and control E is a very good 
way to do that. So now that uh, we understood understand uh, understood the uh, the control key operations, let's look at uh, how we can get help in uh, Linux. So in Linux, um, you can get help in many ways. One of the ways that you can get a, get help on a particular command is to use uh, what is called man. The man is the short form for manual, so it is like a opening up a manual and then looking at what a particular command does. So the way to use this option is just type man with some options, or the options are just optional, and then followed by the command. So the man options are this dash m stands for the keyword path to the man pages or dash k the keyword list command for all the keyword matches so you can say man dash k and then you can say uh, anything that you want maybe you want to just say dir and then it prints out all the keyword matches for that particular man command. So again, you if you look at this one, uh, this also the the man also follows the same syntax that we talked about. That is the command followed by options, followed by arguments. So here, the command that you are interested in to get the man pages becomes the argument for the man command itself. So again, in Unix, uh, this is one of the key features. Basically, you have the commands as arguments um, for various uh, other commands. Now, um, another way to get uh, help is to just type the command itself and then use a dash help. Here, the dash help is the option, there are no arguments, and then the command is just your regular command. And here, you can use like dash help and dash dash help. Interchangeably. So, now let's look at an example of uh, how the man is uh, used. So here, I'll, I'll briefly talk about various pieces. First of all, the X term. You see here is the terminal that popped up after opening the Linux. This is after you log in and then finally it came to the this particular prompt, uh, particular terminal. And in the terminal you have all these uh, various buttons. This is for minimizing, maximizing, and then actually removing this uh, X term itself. Um, there is also you can go to the border and actually. Um, Click on it and drag and make the windows bigger or smaller uh, for you to work with. Now let's look at here. Here it says uh, the root is the name of the user here, um, and then this ACPR60 is the name of the machine that this person logged in. So here. Essentially, like this root does not mean the file system root, but it is um, the person who is logging in. Uh, so the, this person's uh, login name is root, which is essentially a super user. And then um, um, the machine itself is this uh, uh, KACPR60, and um, this is the directory. Typically, this is the, the Linux is the directory, and then the dollar sign denotes the shell. Here, this is uh, most likely a BASH or the bash shell. Now, this person is uh, now we are we are giving this command. So it's a man, and then dash m. So do you think this will work? Now you can see that actually it didn't work because man 
as a command as an option but does not have an argument so it says this option requires an argument which is the dash n and then this is the version of the man that is that is getting installed and actually remove some of these uh, annotations so that we can see it better and now it also provides you with a usage how to use the man itself so here it says man usage all these are your options and then including this and then there is a compulsory thing which is the name which is essentially the name of the command and then it goes on to actually explain to you, explain you as to what each of these options mean for example a is find all the matching entries we already saw there's some of them to the uppercase m that we saw the path the, to search, set the search path for the manual pages the path so if you give dash m with the path it uses that path to go and search for the man pages itself and then we also saw like the dash uh, k which is um, here it says basically like I mean, the same as the a command so you, you know basically how to do that uh, the other options um, um, some of the interesting ones like um, the print location of the man pages uh, dash w uh, in fact I typically use the man command with probably like even without any arguments and just a man and then the command uh, that works most of the cases unless you want to change some of these uh, things so this is one of the key things um, so now you know how to get help within the system within for every command. So this is what we will see in the next slide. Um, so again, it's a uh, here it is described in more details. The dash a lists all files and directories, even the hidden ones. Um, that are preceded by dot. So one key thing about Linux is uh, some of these files um, you won't be able to see it uh, when you do a just a display command uh, unless you provide this dash a option. A stands for all. And then uh, dash l is uh, is the size, creation date, and the permissions. The l actually stands for long. So it provides a long option essentially like I mean it gives you more details about uh, various things. Then the dash D actually lists the directory um, and dash C is uh, it will not create a file if it is already present we will see like how to use this dash S is typically means that the force and um, dash k is the block size dash r is another key um, option uh, this could be an uppercase r or a lowercase r which is, uh, stands for the recursive and see let's see like how we can use this one because it is useful for uh, copying removing things like that to use this uh, recursive uh, nature dash t is the type and then finally dash v typically prints out the version so if you want to know which version of a particular command is being used you can just simply say the command dash v and then it should produce that version for example in the previous slide we saw that um, the Linux actually even by default it printed out the version as 1.501. So now we will go into various commands and um, I will start with uh, ls, ls stands for list and um, this is mainly used to list the files 
in the current directory. So there is a concept of a directory. We saw the file structure with the root directory as the slash, and then there you can also have a bunch of directories under that. So every directory contains number of files, and to list the number of files, we use this command called ls. Um, in fact, there is an analog analogous command even in the Windows world. Um, where you can display the number of uh, or the, the name of the, all the files inside a directory, and ls also has uh, many options. Um, again, as I mentioned, the dash l uh, that's one of them, which is for the long list, displays a lot more information. Dash t is a list by modification date, uh, which is very useful. Uh, because it sorts by the modification date, and um, you can actually um, the dash t option gives uh, the files from the latest to the oldest um, modified. Um, we can do a r to reverse that order. So again, you can combine like these some of these. Um, I mean, actually, all these options. Uh, together, um, they're not. You, can, you don't need to use them exclusively. And uppercase S lists by size. H is uh, list file sizes in a human readable format. Um, and then I told you the R reverses the order. A looks for all the hidden files. Again, the file names that start with dot are hidden. So if you just simply give an ls command it won't show up unless you put an ls dash a and then uh, uppercase f this uh, file of a particular directory. So one of the useful thing is uh, here you can see that uh, as I mentioned the options can be combined can someone tell me what this command will return ls minus ltr. I think you are correct this returns the long form of the files the long name it sorts first by the modification date from the the latest to the to the oldest but then because you see an R it reverses the order so actually it displays the files from the oldest to the latest the latest files displayed at the very end um, of the list I think like um, you should be clear um, I also urge you to actually type man dash ls or man ls to get the manual entry for the ls command itself and it should it should print you like uh, all these options and then it also tells you whether you need an argument or not again uh, I want to ask you that question too does ls need an argument I think again you are correct it does not need an argument because it just lists the files in this directory and double uh, l is again a short form which stands for probably the ls minus l so and then these are what are known as aliases we will um, also look at some of these things and how to set up the aliases in the coming section um, but this will be a good introduction for ls command and uh, I want you to actually try it out and just play with uh, these commands as we go along and then see how they work and uh, what you learn from them. So now let us look at actually using the ls command uh, in a particular directory so here again uh, I do not have to remind you it is an X term uh, and in this terminal all these other things that I mentioned with uh, the, the prompt and then now you type the ls so look at how it produces the files. This is um, just mentioned the ls right so it produces all these things now tell me how these are presented to you 
they have just simply sorted down alphabetical order and then just presented to you in an alphabetical order format. So you can see that one and if you have to read it in various columns this is column number one, column number two, three, four, five and six. You can get the same thing with another option also known as ls dash x that will also print in this format. So now um, we will talk about one more command. Um, so let's go to that. It's uh, called CD. CD stands for Change Directory. So anyone guess uh, how to use this command? So CD is used to move between various directories. So if you want to move from one directory to another, you use this command called CD. So the commands that are most popular in Linux are CD Does it need an argument? Uh, I mentioned that it probably does not have an argument. That is correct in most cases where you don't need to provide an argument, but you can also provide an argument, which uh, which is you can type in ls and then space, and then you can say like I mean a particular file name. Then if that file name is found in that particular directory, it just returns that file name. If it is not found, then it will tell you that this file not found. Now there is a concept called a wildcard, uh, which we will learn in the subsequent sections. The wildcard is typically uh, a character that kind of uh, represents another um, variable or another um, name itself. So, for example, you can say star or the asterisk symbol, which denotes any character or a question mark will denote any character but only of one character length whereas a star can denote um, character of any length or character stream of any length let's say so how can you use it you can say like ls star dot pl then it will only give you the files that have pl in as their last two characters or pl as the suffix because you put like star dot pl if you put a star pl then it will also return to you anything that has pl as the last two characters in the file which is slightly a bigger set than the star dot pl if it is available and if you say like star txt then it only gives you the txt files which are in this case basically it is this copied file ex1 txt ex2 txt f1 txt and maybe out dot txt so it is useful in ls command to actually filter for some files and the others so this is again a very useful command as i mentioned and now let's look at the cd command so the cd command essentially is moves between the directories um, we will briefly touch upon this um, so cd a directory name moves to a directory called the directory name so the cd is the command name there are no options and the argument is the directory directory name so it moves from wherever it is to this particular directory so you don't need to provide where you are moving from essentially because it knows that okay that is where you are anyway. So what does it mean by actually moving from moving to a different directory this means that any command that gets executed subsequently will start as from that directory as a reference so for example say you have a 
directory called slash a and um, you actually went to that directory initially and then you are uh, doing commands like ls then it produces the list of files within that directory called a but now when you do the cd to slash b and then put an ls command now anytime the new command only like looks at that particular directory as its reference so now it produces the list of files in directory b now there are characters which have special meaning for example the tilde the tilde or tilde this denotes your home directory so every user has a home directory where he has uh, he or she has many other files and we will talk about uh, how to create the home directory and what is inside the home directory in a subsequent um, slide uh, so cd tilde moves the cursor to that particular home directory that your home directory and um, so now whenever you execute any subsequent command it always uses your home directory as your reference another one is this dot dot the two dots denote go to the higher level directory in that particular hierarchy so if you have a slash a slash b and uh, from that if you are issuing um, cd dot dot it goes to slash a and then same way like I mean the, the slash indicates the hierarchy separator for the various directories so if you are doing cd dot dot slash dot dot then it moves two level up the hierarchy. Uh, here we we actually like the, the the terms are slightly confusing the hierarchy down. It's actually like I mean the CD dot dot uh, moves it a level up essentially. So the the way to think about it is like you have the slash as the root directory and then say a and then b and then say a has a c underneath and you you are here the dot 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 will move you up to, and then the another dot dot will move you up to the slash. So if you want to go from C to B, there are two ways of doing it. One is CD slash B, that will directly take you to the B, or you can say CD dot dot slash dot dot slash B. So that is another way to get to B. And CD minus actually typically moves using the wherever you are you come, it goes back to that place. For example, if you say from C, CD dot dot slash dot dot slash B, so that now you are here, and then just say CD minus from B, it takes you immediately to. So that is from the previous directory. So I think uh, this should uh, suffice for uh, today's lecture. Um, let's continue from this point uh, the next time. Uh, thank you very much.